times, one or two rumbles of thunder is possible and the wind's increasing too. But a mild night for everyone, even under the clear skies in the south, temperatures 11 to 17 Celsius. So a sunny start across central, southern, southeastern parts on Saturday morning. Cloud and rain continuing across Scotland, Northern Ireland, this spreading into Wales, Northern England and the West Country. Rain mostly confined to the higher ground, but coastal areas turning a bit murky as the afternoon wears on. Here, temperatures 21 to 24, 26, 27 in the best of the dry and sunny weather across southeast England. Outbreaks of rain continue to push through through the rest of Saturday into Sunday across much of the UK and into Monday, starting to turn a little bit fresher across the north. But in the south, temperatures holding up 27, 28 degrees. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harwood and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harwood, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30 Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. A very good morning to you. It's 9.31 and this is The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood. Today we explore the electability, the politics of net zero. We also explore that hustings last night. Is there anything Rishi Sunak can do to win? And housing policy and red tape. We explore it all coming up after the headlines. Good morning, it's 9.31. I'm Tamsin Roberts in the GB Newsroom. A murder investigation has been launched after a nine-year-old girl died from suspected stab wounds in Boston. Lincolnshire police shut down an area near Fountain Lane yesterday evening. They say the victim's parents have been informed and are being supported by specialist officers. has received the support of the Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace. It comes after the first official hustings in Leeds last night, in which Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak appeared before Conservative Party members. The AA has issued its first amber traffic warning for significant congestion for today and tomorrow. It says the worst of the traffic will be between 11am and 3pm, fuelled by the school holidays, a rail strike and the Commonwealth Games. A £400 discount on energy bills will be paid in six monthly instalments from October. The support for all households was announced by the Chancellor in May. It comes as the energy price cap is expected to rise to at least £3,500 in October. 
The Prince of Wales has opened the Commonwealth Games in Birmingham on behalf of the Queen. In his opening speech, he celebrated the connections between the Commonwealth nations and said the countries are one family. TV, online and DAB Plus Radio, this is GB News. Now it's back to the briefing with Tom Harwood. A very good morning to you. It's 9.33 and this is The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, on your TV and your radio. Well, first today, as the leadership contest continues, the candidates and policy think tanks continue to conduct research to establish the top concerns for voters, both, of course, amongst members, but also, crucially, the general election electorate as well. Well, the think tank Onward has released new research that they say categorise their mission as developing bold and practical ideas. Sorry, I'm misreading a whole bunch of that. We'll just skip ahead to get to exactly what we're talking about today. I'm joined, of course, by Will Tanner, director of the Onward Think Tank. And Will, I understand you have a new paper out this morning about going green or indeed maintaining the green policies of this government, particularly in terms of how swing voters feel about these policies. Uh, what do they think? Well, morning, Tom. Uh, and as you say, we've published a report this morning that looks at what conservative voters and uh, conservative considerers, people who might consider voted conservative but are currently undecided, think about environmental policy. There's been a bit of talk in this election about net zero. Both candidates have committed to it in principle, but uh, not as uh, as wholeheartedly, perhaps, as Boris Johnson has done over the last few years. And we wanted to understand which voters are in support of net zero and which ones are, are less so. And what we found is that conservative voters are overwhelmingly in support of net zero. So conservative voters are around 50% more likely to say that the Conservative Party should keep net zero than to ditch net zero. And if you look at wavering voters, uh, those voters are twice as likely to want the new leader uh, to keep net zero. Those, those undecided voters you might consider that net zero is actually something that might bring them back to the Conservatives. It's interesting looking at the, the, the framing of net zero. Of course, this is something that feels a very long time away. I wonder if there's a difference in terms of how swing voters feel about the uh, almost ethereal concept of net zero, something that I think everyone would like us to achieve down the line, versus the policies by which we get there, which might in some ways be more contentious. So I think there is something in that. Net zero is something that as you say, is 30-odd uh, years away and will require big changes, some of which won't touch voters at all. It will be things in, in industry or in uh, the wider global economy. Um, but uh, I do think that what we've seen over the last few months is actually, uh, instead of things like Ukraine and rising energy bills undermining support for net zero, it actually seems to have strengthened support for net zero. Voters seem to be more willing to see action to develop renewable energy at home. Uh, and in our poll today, we see a very strong level of support for things like investing in uh, wind power uh, and uh, and uh, actually kind of greater support for environmental action more generally, because they see that as key to energy security uh, and actually a way to reduce bills in the longer term. So uh, I think you're right that net zero is further away, but recent events seem to be strengthening support for it rather than undermining. It's interesting looking at what the leadership contenders in the current Conservative leadership uh, contest have been saying. When it comes to energy, they're both uh, saying that fracking is something that should go forward uh, where local communities consent. Now, that seems to be a bit of a Weasley phrase because we don't know of any local communities that currently would support it. But I suppose that leaves the door a little bit open to that. Interestingly, Rishi Sunak pushing for a ban on wind power onshore even though he wants more offshore. I wonder, does that chime with where voters are? Well, what we've seen uh, in our polling is very strong support for offshore wind. Uh, there is other polling available that suggests that voters, in principle, support onshore wind as well. Uh, although uh, I would wager that there is some degree of kind of 
NIMBYism there that uh, they might support it in principle, a bit like housing. People support housing in principle, but when it's on their doorstep, they might be a bit more reluctant. Uh, when I was in Downing Street, actually, we proposed something called the Shale Wealth Fund, specifically to reward communities that welcomed fracking in their area, effectively to say that they should get a share of the proceeds of uh, natural gas fracked in their community to try and encourage and incentivize communities to uh, embrace that type of power. And I think uh, that type of model could work quite effectively for, for some of the more contentious forms of renewable power. Yes, it is something that I think Liz Truss has sort of at least uh, uh, highlighted, this idea that shale gas uh, could, could well provide dividends. And I suppose that could easily extend to having a a wind turbine in your back garden. No doubt a lot of people might uh, prefer a wind turbine in their back garden to going cold at winter. I do wonder just finally in this conversation, in terms of the wider debate that we've seen in this leadership contest, it seems to have focused so much on tax. It seems to have focused so much on these two different visions from the candidates on that issue. Have we had that discussion to the exclusion of all of the other issues that people are facing in the country, whether it's crime, whether it's energy, whether it's all of these other issues that potentially have been excluded from the debate? I think that's absolutely right. This debate has been fought on quite narrow ideological uh, territory uh, at the heart of conservatism, but actually quite far away from where most voters are. If you talk to voters about what matters to them, it is rising energy bills and rising cost of living generally. It's the state of the NHS. It's things like crime and immigration. It's the state of their schools, uh, the ability of their, for them to get a GP appointment. And we've heard actually relatively little about those bread and butter issues during this race and far more about quite highfalutin intellectual ideas that obsess people like me and think tanks in Westminster. And I think the contest would do well as we approach the kind of the next few weeks and, and approach the, the kind of final three or four weeks of the contest, that the candidates focus much more on what voters really care about, because ultimately they're going to need to win an election. Bill Tanner, thank you so much for joining us this morning. And thank you in an earlier answer for bringing up NIMBYism and housing, because that's teed us up so very nicely for our next segment. Will Tanner, thank you very much for joining us. Well, let's talk specifically about housing. And what, even more specifically, is up with Rishi Sunak's new housing policy? He pledges to preserve the green belt in Aspic, banning councils from amending it, preventing development around the dozen or so cities that the green belt currently covers. He also says that any new house building should be done on brownfield land, which may come as a surprise to his local council, as the very same Rishi Sunak applied for planning permission to build a new single-storey sporting complex on a green field near his Grade 2 listed home only last year. Yes, in Rishi Sunak's world, only he is allowed to build on fields. No one else can. But beyond the hypocrisy, let's explore this idea in its own terms. Because to most of us, preventing any green belt amendments might, at face value, seem like a nice thing. Well, let's turn to a case study in York, where controversy erupted earlier this year when a developer proposed to construct up to 158 homes on land sandwiched between a housing estate, a dual car carriageway and railway lines. So why was there uproar about this scrap of land? Well, it had been designated as part of the Green Belt back in the 1940s. Fortunately, the council in the end saw sense. The Green Belt was amended and the homes in this tiny corner of land were approved. Yet, under Rishi Sunak's policy, this peculiar cut-off bit of land by the road and the railway would stay forever undeveloped and unloved. But surely that's just an anomaly, right? The rest of the Green Belt is, in reality, the rolling fields that our minds go to when we think of England. Well, not quite. This is where the Green Belt actually is. Frozen land around a dozen or so cities that are deemed to be important. It doesn't include those areas of outstanding natural beauty in England that we know so well. It doesn't cover the Chilterns, the Yorkshire Dales, the Lake District, the Peak District, the Cotswolds, the South Downs, Dartmoor, Thetford or the New Forest. No, none of those areas are green belt. Most green land in England is not green belt. And indeed, some green belt is not green land. No, the most beautiful parts of our country, the parts that protecting perhaps matters most, are entirely distinct from the green belt. Yet I get the sneaking feeling that when we think of green belt, our minds erroneously but understandably go to those areas of outstanding natural beauty. 
But what did I mean when I said that some green belt is not green land? Well, a project to build 40 social rented homes was rejected from this scrap of concrete because it has green belt status. Indeed, this junkyard is some of London's green belt. And so is this tip. And even this car wash. Yes, in fact, a former Bradford councillor took to social media yesterday to dispel some green belt myths. Simon Cook was a councillor for 24 years and he took to Twitter to share the reality of what the green belt, just in his ward, really looks like. It included the site of an old mill, several scrap yards, a car park, an empty chicken slaughterhouse, some empty unused buildings as well. Unable to be redeveloped, of course, and remember, all of this is green belt in just one council ward. Yes, some green belt simply isn't green at all. And we might all be better off with a rationalisation, a reclassification, classifying some of our genuinely precious areas of natural beauty as green belt and freeing up some of the ugliest, most concrete blighted road or railside bits of what is erroneously called the green belt right now. Here is perhaps a surprising fact. In 1979, the green belt covered 721,000 hectares of England. By 2020, that had more than doubled to 1.6 million hectares of England. It is possible to enhance protections, to rationalise the system, but none of that can be done with unthinking pledges that Greenbelt can never, ever be touched. Not even the concrete bits. Though Sunak's desperate attempt at populism is wrong. It doesn't protect green land in the way he would like you to think it does. And it will make it even harder for young people to get on that housing ladder. And that in and of itself is an existential question for the Conservative Party. Without enough homes, with young people stuck in renting traps, with nothing of their own to conserve, the Tory party will find it harder and harder to win those votes. Any leader serious about a home-owning democracy, serious about winning elections, and frankly, serious about conservatism, would not trumpet big government clumsy planning policy that prevents sensible development. Rishi needs a rethink. Well, let's explore some of those themes a little bit more with the author of a new report on the cost of living from the Institute of Economic Affairs, entitled Cutting Through. Yes, Matthew Lesh co-wrote the paper which says that cutting red tape can significantly lower costs for households in areas like childcare, employment, energy and indeed housing. So, uh, Matthew Lesh, you've been a researcher for uh, quite a few years now and you've looked at these areas of policy. Let's start off with Rishi Sunak's proposal for the Green Belt. Uh, what do you make of it? I think it's an extremely disappointing announcement. As you've very well explained, the Green Belt is not about protecting green land. It's about preventing urban sprawl. And it's failed in its own terms. What it's resulted in is just housing being built outside of um, the restrictions of the Green Belt. Now, that's actually been bad for the environment. That's led to longer commute times, more pollution, uh, as, as well as not particularly protecting green space in the way it was intended to do so. Now, what Rishi said here is even if a local community decides that they don't want to protect a certain part of their Green Belt, he's not going to let them. So he's centralising control to Westminster, to Whitehall, and removing that local control that could enable more houses to be built on parts of the Green Belt that might be appropriate, let's say near stations or something that's intense agricultural land that provides very little environmental benefit. I think we need a much smarter debate about housing, housing and planning rather than something that's clearly announced to tick a, a few NIMBY boxes without getting to the root cause of why we're paying so much for housing, why, how the planning system has made it so difficult to get win-win results. And yet, isn't this exactly the conversation that Rishi Sunak's campaign would want us to be having right now? You and I are talking about how more ho houses might be built. And frankly, a significant proportion of the Conservative Party membership are people who already own houses, who might not see it as such a pressing need to have more houses built in what will not turn out to be an electoral dividend for the Conservative Party for perhaps another generation. Look, I think this is a, a, a difficult discourse for the Tory party. But of course, the trade-off here is 
if you, in the short run, prevent houses being built, that might keep your existing constituents happy. But it is a very much driving disquiet and anger about the state of the world for younger voters. Um, if you're not going to have conservative voters in future, you're going to have a lot less. If they're being locked out of the housing market, it's much more difficult to form families. Um, their, their, their cost of living and their quality of life is down. Um, no wonder you're going to see huge, and you already see this in the um, electoral maths, huge differences in vote by age. What I'd like to see from Mr. is something like street votes, for example, that could enable more houses to be built in a way that is locally popular. Now, this is this, this brilliant idea that's been put forward by um, a range of think tanks and, and key policy thinkers and supported by people across the spectrum, that you allow um, streets to agree to moderately densify, uh, to build an extra story, to, to use um, additional space uh, in, in their street. Now, that's something that can benefit everyone because you get giving permission to everyone simultaneously, and it can be done in a, in a smart, intelligent way without disquieting or, or, or causing people to have loss from the fact that there's more housing on their street. Now, unfortunately... Well, I, I suppose to be fair to Rishi Sunak, this, that would be classified as brownfield development. So I'm not sure he was. he's said that he uh, opposes that at all. I, I do wonder, however, though, if we look at some of these seats that border places like London that used to be conservative and now are trending Labour or indeed Liberal Democrats, how much can we put that down to the housing crisis, that young people can't afford to live in inner cities anymore and so are moving out into these Tory seats and that's trending them away from the Conservatives? Look, I, I think there's, there's certainly an argument to make that case. I mean, there's obviously a lot of reasons why younger people might want to be voting Tory in such high numbers. There's, there's a whole range of cultural issues. But I think the, the, the cost of living and the, the economic um, questions are absolutely essential. Now, there is an ironic sense here, which is if the government took on policies to encourage densification in the inner cities, that could actually ensure that Labour um, Lib Dem voters are constricted in that space. So they wouldn't be moving out into Tory areas. So there could be an electoral benefit there if you want to do that on the calculus. But what I think is probably more important is the cost of living question. Um, in our new paper, Cutting Through from, from the IEA, we, we were looking at the, the latest statistics and it now costs nine times the median income uh, to buy a house. It used to cost five times 20 years ago um, and even less before that. Now that is at an unaffordable level of housing. Um, getting rid of some of the restrictions in, in terms of the planning system, however you do it, could substantially reduce people's rent and, and ensure the kind of property earning democracy that the Tory party um, is meant to be promoting. It is a really excellent paper and I do encourage everyone to go and seek it out because it's not just about housing, of course. There's so much red tape when it comes to employment, when it comes to energy, when it indeed comes to childcare as well. The amount of that we regulate our childcare in this country so much more than even uh, Nordic countries do. It's extraordinary. And I think your paper suggests that up to £9,000 a year could be saved for families. Uh, if we reform these uh, these bits of red tape, uh, I'm, I'm afraid we've, so the paper we, have run to, we have run to the end of this segment, Matthew Lesh. But thank you so much for joining us, and no doubt we'll have you back soon to talk about some of those other big important issues that you raise. Well, now, last night, Leeds hosted the first of 12 regional hustings hosted by the Conservative Party over the summer. Rishi Sunak and Foreign Secretary Liz Truss appeared in front of over a 1,000 Tory members and activists. One audience member accused former Chancellor Rishi Sunak of stabbing Boris Johnson in the back after quitting. Let's have a listen. Stabbed him in the back. Um, he is a man who made you as a senior politician. And some people don't want to see that in number 10. You're going to have to take the party in the country through another general election. And, you know, I'm not quite sure entirely which planet you're on. I'm very grateful to the PM for giving me the job of Chancellor. But as you also saw over the past two and a half years, I gave my everything to that job. Well, meanwhile, Liz Truss was quizzed on whether she would accidentally walk us into World War III due to her stance on Ukraine. She added it was completely wrong to listen to sabre-rattling or propaganda from Russia. Well, let's dissect everything that happened last night now with Henry Hill, the deputy editor of the Conservative Home website. Uh, Henry, thank you so much for joining us. I was looking at one of the Conservative Home's monthly surveys of members earlier this morning. Now, this was carried out at the start of the month. Uh, in fact, just a few hours before those resignations that brought Boris Johnson tumbling down. And interestingly on that survey, Liz Truss is very much near the top, incredibly high approval with me the membership, and Rishi Sunak was in negative territory. I wonder, looking at your surveys uh, over the last few months, 
And looking at the way that the race has turned out with Liz Truss storming ahead of Rishi Sunak, shouldn't we have all seen this coming? Yeah, there's certainly an argument to be made for that. I think what's happened is that what seems to be happening so far anyway, I should say, is that for the first time in almost living memory, we're having a Tory leadership contest, which is playing out exactly as it looked like it would play out before it happened. This has never happened before. You know, Normally, by this stage in the contest, we're against the person who, one of the people who everyone was talking about, and then a relative unknown, you know, your Andrea Leadsom figure, your Ian Duncan Smith, somebody who nobody had really expected to be in the final two. Instead, we both have the candidate of the right and the candidate of the party establishment that we were expecting, and their poll position is roughly where they were a few months ago. So yes, we should have seen it coming, but that is itself quite unusual. And turning to the hustings yesterday, this was the first of 12 regional hustings. Uh, it was quite well attended, actually. It was uh, much more of a professional looking event than anything I'd seen the Conservative Party put on before, especially compared to the 2019 election. Do you think that these hustings will actually change any minds? Well, it's interesting because on the one hand, we don't really learn all that much that we hadn't learnt before. There are occasional tidbits. So, you know, Rishi Sunak is apparently in favour of grammar schools. That's interesting. I don't think I knew that. Unfortunately, we didn't get much detail. But they, they really do two things. First, every hustings gives Rishi Sunak a chance to close the gap. It's not necessarily that he will. He hasn't done it in the debate so far. But he is the better debate performer. And each and every one of them is a chance for Liz Truss to trip up. But the second difference I really think they're making is that there's going to be 12. There's going to be one in every region of England, plus Wales, Scotland and Northern Ireland. And it's clear that this means that the candidates who, while they were in London, were, as the previous speaker was saying, were fighting on a very narrow range of macroeconomic and tax questions, are going to have to find policies for all these areas of the country that they're going to be quizzed in. Now, we've already seen the impact of this because Liz Truss has randomly committed to delivering Northern Powerhouse Rail in full. Now, I think that's a great policy, but there was no suggestion that she was going to do it before she you know, needed some good front pages on those local papers. So we've got 11 to go. And I think that we're now going to see Rishi Sunak coming up with Scottish policy, Liz Trust having to think of something to do for Wales or Cornwall. And that's a hugely positive thing. That's a really interesting point. But also one of the things that I was so interested with was, was, was just how well attended this hustings was. There was a lot of online speculation that the Tory party's charging its members to go to these hustings, that this is, uh, g that this is going to be a bit of a, a disaster. And yet, actually, there seems to be a lot of enthusiasm for this contest amongst the grassroots. In, in many ways, this is the first time we've had a sort of ideological battle within the Conservative Party for the leadership. 2019 was Brexit, 2016 was Brexit. The last time we had these sort of discussions in the Conservative Party, it was 2005. Yeah, well, I think actually, ironically, the, 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 the fee that the Tory party was charging for physical attendance, which I think was only about five pounds, so you shouldn't overstate it, might have actually helped attendance because according to the party, the problem they had previously is that people would sign up because it was free and then simply not feel like going on the day. And so having made that commitment and put in a, a very small barrier to entry, it seems to have improved turnout. And I think there is a lot of, uh, enthusiasm for the race but I think I think it is nonetheless slightly for the for a lot of the members it is slightly disappointing that we've ended up with the with the final two that we have you know there was a big push for Kemi Badnock amongst the grassroots our polling and most other polling suggested that she would have walked the second round I don't think people necessarily in their heart of hearts wanted a contest between two people who had been very senior members of Boris Johnson's government but nonetheless there is an important difference in the two candidates. Rishi Sunak stands for one Tory principle, which is sound money, which is no not paying for day-to-day -day spending by borrowing. It's a perfectly respectable Tory principle. On the other hand, you've got Liz Trust, tax cuts go for growth. It's a fascinating contest. It certainly is. And Henry Hill, thank you so much for talking us through that as well. We'll follow it, of course, with interest, although it does look increasingly like it's Liz Truss's contest to lose. Well, that's it for the programme today. Thank you for joining me. I'm back at 9.30 on Monday. Up next, it's to the point, but first, here's the weather. Hello there, I'm Greg Dewhurst and welcome to Friday's forecast. It's looking dry for many of us. There'll be plenty of sunny spells, but there is the risk of a few showers. Feeling warm as well. The reason for this is high pressure is just about holding on for another day across the UK, keeping it settled. However, into the weekend, we'll see Atlantic systems moving in, bringing cloud and outbreaks of rain. So all of us seeing some rain at some point over the weekend. 
for Friday morning, the best of the sunshine will be across central southern parts of England and Wales. A cloudier zone across the Pennines up into the border, some splashes of rain possible here. However, into the afternoon it should brighten up, but a few scattered showers developing here. For Wales, the Midlands as well, perhaps cloudier for a time, the risk of one or two showers. But for many of us, a dry day, plenty of sunny spells, lifting temperatures into the low to mid-20s, 27, possibly 28 across the London area Friday afternoon. Little change across England and Wales through the evening period. One or two light showers possible, most places dry. However, Northern Ireland, Scotland, later on in the evening into the early hours of Saturday morning, cloud and outbreaks of rain moving in from the Atlantic. Some of this rain could be heavy at times. One or two rumbles of thunder is possible and the winds increasing too. But a mild night for everyone, even under the clear skies in the south, temperatures 11 to 17 Celsius. So a sunny start across central, southern, southeastern parts on Saturday morning. Cloud and rain continuing across Scotland, Northern Ireland, this spreading into Wales, Northern England and the West Country. Rain mostly confined to the higher ground, but coastal areas turning a bit murky as the afternoon wears on. Here temperatures 21 to 24, 26, 27 in the best of the dry and sunny weather across southeast England. Outbreaks of rain continue to push through for the rest of Saturday into Sunday across much of the UK and into Monday, starting to turn a little bit fresher across the north. But in the south, temperatures holding up 27, 28 degrees. We are GB News. We're right across this great nation. On TV. On radio. On digital. Absolutely everywhere. We don't talk down to you. We embrace all voices with honest and civilised conversation. We are not part of the establishment. We are one of you. And we're only getting started. Join us on GB News. The People's Channel. Britain's News Channel. Hi there, it's Stephen and Anne. At breakfast from 6am, you'll always be caught up with everything you need to know. The latest headlines, opinions and debates. We'll bring you the good news and the bad, but most of all, we're here for you. Remember, send in your views and let us know what you would like us to talk about. That's because we're your news channel. And every morning at 6am, it's breakfast on GB News. My name's Tom Harvard and join me 9.30am every weekday for The Briefing, your one-stop shop for everything you need to know about what's going on in politics today. I wonder if this is a deal that might need to be like the biscuits in this factory, twice baked. Is there not an opportunity here to win out against the extremes? Tom Harvard, GB News. What are you going to do about it? Things should have been done differently and they, and they certainly are being done differently. Don't miss it. The Briefing with me, Tom Harwood, 9.30, Monday to Friday on GB News. Where would you like to go? Just take me to the studio, please, mate. You know where you're going. I've got a show to do. Friday Night Feast on GB News, 7pm. And it's like nothing you've ever seen before. We take a different angle on the week's biggest news stories. The viewers and listeners sent me some absolutely mad challenges to do. We tried to rehome a rescue dog. And yes, there's some other wacky stuff in there as well. I feel like I could take on the world. Well, that's that. Friday Night Feast with me, Patrick Christie's, every Friday, 7 till 9pm on GB News. Be there. Good morning, this is To The Point on GB News with me, Darren Grimes, on your telly, radio and online. We're with you today until midday with a show jam-packed with all of the day's biggest stories, lots of discussion, expert guests and our opinions as well as your own. Make sure you get in touch with your views as usual on gbviews at gbnews.uk. We'll be getting to those throughout the show. But first, it's time for the latest news. Good morning, it's one minute past ten. I'm Tamsin Roberts. Here's the latest from the GB newsroom. A murder investigation has been launched after a nine-year-old girl died from suspected stab wounds in Boston. Well, our home and security editor, Mark White, is at the scene for us this morning. And, Mark, what more can you tell us? 
Well, clearly a, an absolutely shocking sequence of events that unfolded at 6.20, we're told, last night. There still is a police cordon here, as you would understand. We're right in the heart of Boston town centre. In fact, if Paul, our cameraman, can just uh, pan off to uh, the right, you can see there's a small... Uh, forensic silver tent there that's covering uh, the scene where we believe that uh, the young girl was found uh, just after 20 past six uh, this morning. A few forensic markers in yellow around that immediate crime scene as well. No updates really from Lincolnshire Police since they put out their initial news release last night to confirm that a nine-year-old girl had died of a suspected stab wound following this incident. We're told that uh, of course the family have been informed. Uh, the young girl hasn't been named. The family are being comforted by specialist officers from Lincolnshire Police. Uh, we are told about the possibility of some kind of police statement from Lincolnshire police this morning perhaps in the next half hour or so uh, because as yet we have no information uh, on the ongoing investigation as to what the cause of this incident was and of course crucially whether anyone is in custody at this stage the initial news release the information that came out last night didn't report that anyone had been arrested in connection with the death of this nine-year-old girl but clearly uh, a shocking series of events that uh, have numbed the community here. The local MP has spoken to the policing minister in London to assure that there is national support for this regional police force should they require it. OK, Mark, for now, thank you very much. Mark White reporting there. Former police officer Wayne Cousins has lost his court of appeal bid to reduce his whole life sentence for the murder of Sarah Everard. His lawyers had argued that it was excessive, but the court ruled that the sentencing judge was entitled to impose it because of the way Cousins had abused his power as a police officer. Liz Truss's campaign for number 10 has received the support of the Defence Secretary, Ben Wallace. It comes after the first official hustings in Leeds last night, in which Liz Truss and Rishi Sunak appeared before Conservative Party members. Speaking to GB News, Ben Wallace explained why he's backing the Foreign Secretary. What you see is what you get. Uh, I've sat next to her. She has experience. She was everything from the nation's bookkeeper. She was the Chief Secretary of the Treasury for nearly two years in the Treasury. She was, you know, at DEFRA, that's the Farming and Environment Brief. She's been the International Trade Secretary and the Foreign Secretary. She's got a lot of experience. Whoever is going to be the next Prime Minister needs experience and they need to cover both the threats abroad and the economy at home. She's the only candidate that can do both. Well, in last night's hustings, Rishi Sunak acknowledged that he's trailing Liz Truss. But one of his supporters, Damien Hines, told GB News that people are persuaded to back the former Chancellor once they meet him. People I'm speaking to, I hear repeatedly that they see Rishi Sunak as the right candidate, the right character, to bring us through this, to deliver a, a bright future, a conservative future, to, to win that historic fifth general election, but crucially along the way to get the economy back on track, to deal with the cost of living crisis we've got. And he's the candidate with the character, with the experience, with the determination and the vision to do that. The AA has issued its first amber traffic warning for significant congestion covering today and tomorrow. It says the worst of the traffic will be between 11am and 3pm, fuelled by the school holidays, a rail strike and the Commonwealth Games. Roads to Dover and the Eurotunnel, along with those that lead to Devon and Cornwall, are expected to be very busy. A £400 discount on energy bills will be paid in six monthly instalments from October. The support for all households was announced by the Chancellor in May. It comes as the energy price cap is expected to rise to at least £3,500 in October. Footballers' wives Rebecca Vardy and Colleen Rooney will find out who has won their libel case when the High Court rules later today. Vardy sued Rooney after she accused her on social media of leaking stories to the press. Mrs Rooney defended the claim on the basis that it was substantially true. This is GB News. We'll bring you more news as it happens. Now it's back to To The Point.
Good morning. This is